So this annual lecture had an auspicious start last year. It was in the same uh, venue. It was the inaugural address, and it was given by Sir Harold Evans. And uh, those of you that were here know what an impact he made. And this year, we're absolutely delighted to welcome our speakers, Jackie Ashley and Andrew Marr. Their involvement is particularly fitting as Jackie's father, the Right Honourable Jack Ashley, campaigned shoulder to shoulder with Alf Morris and the Disabled Persons Movement to secure human rights for disabled people. And tonight is the first time that they've spoken publicly of um, uh, how they've dealt uh, with the stroke that Andrew had in 2013. Although neither of them need any introduction, I thought I would just give a very, very brief summary uh, for those of you in the room who might not be aware of their collective achievements. Jackie Ashley has been a high-profile political journalist and commentator for ITN, Channel 4 News, the BBC, the New Statesman, and The Guardian. She also sits on a number of boards, including University College London's Hospital, Biomedical Research Council, Burbank College, University of London Centre for the Study of Politics and Women in Sport. Jackie Ashley became president of Lucy Cavendish College in autumn 2015. The college is one of the prime institutions championing the education of women. And of course, Jackie is the daughter, as I've already mentioned, of Lord Jack Ashley of Stoke the formidable fighter for the rights of disabled people. Andrew is a BAFTA and Royal Television Society award-winning journalist and broadcaster. Andrew was the BBC's political editor between 2000 and 2005, and he has hosted the Andrew Marr Show on Sunday mornings for over 10 years, as well as regularly interviewing figures of national and international significance. Andrew has written and presented numerous series for the BBC and is the author of several books, including most recently, We British, The Poetry of a People. And it was in January 2013 that Andrew survived a major stroke. So we're absolutely delighted to be having them uh, as, our, as our joint speakers tonight. And this event and all the benefits from this event will, will go directly to assisting the Disability Living Foundation, which is a part of, of Shore Trust now, to help millions of people who are struggling with disability, either as a permanent disability or something that's occurred recently in their lives. And finally, I would just like to um, uh, let you all know that in October of this year, Shore Trust and DLF are hosting the Global Congress on Rehabilitation in Edinburgh. The last time it was here was in the 1950s. And we see tonight's event and that event uh, in October as being the major launch of a campaign to help disabled people, currently 2.2 million people in the UK who are disabled would like to work um, and have not been able to find, to find work, and government is committed to trying to help a million of those get into work in the next five years. We would like to see this event and the event in October be the spearhead for breaking once and for all the, the gap between people with a disability and, uh, and unemployment. And so I greatly welcome you here tonight. I welcome our speakers. Please relax and enjoy it, and we'll take questions and answers afterwards. Thank you very much. We're just having a chat about which is the dominant side. I don't know if you've seen the um, things on the B about the BBC uh, breakfast show where the, the man was always on the left side or the right side. Anyway, here As we ever are. with us, that's the dominant side. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to you all. It's very hard for us to see because the lights are so bright, but judging by the laughter, there's a few of you here, so that's great. Um, delighted to see you all. I just want to say, first of all, how thrilled we are to be here tonight uh, to give the Alf Morris uh, Memorial Lecture. Alf Morris and my father, Jack Ashley, were the terrible twins, really, fighting um, disability dis discrimination from the very early days when they were both in Parliament. We saw the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, the Disability Discrimination Act, uh, opposition to the Welfare Reform Bill. The two of them were really the two most tireless campaigners for disabled people that Parliament has ever seen. Uh, and never has there been more of a need for them to be around. If they must be turning in their graves, both of them, at what is happening this week. Um, I don't agree with everything Jeremy Corbyn says, but when he says this government is launching a war on disabled people, I have to agree. 
um, I think the things that were announced in the budget yesterday were pretty shameful. Now, before I say any more about politics, I must say that I'm speaking personally and for myself and not for Andrew, because as a BBC employee, he has no political views whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> they were all surgically removed when he joined the BBC. So if I, start, if I start attacking the government, then that's me, it's not Andrew. <laughs> so he would just sit there, not even nod, he'd just look neutral. A BBC, a BBC neutral person he is. Uh, what we thought we'd do this evening is talk about um, our joint experience of Andrew Stroke, because it, it was a joint experience, it was a whole family experience, um, and then sort of see if we can draw a few lessons from our personal experience and perhaps a few policy implications as well. So without more ado, I'm going to start by asking Andrew to give his account of what happened that fateful night in January 2013. Thank you, Jackie. What we're going to do is we're going to try and uh, break the experience up into kind of Phases. So this is the bit which goes from pre-stroke to the stroke itself. Um, I should start by saying I was a complete classic male fool. I had been overworking grossly for two years, travelling around the world, writing a book, working at the weekends, and I had never ever stopped. And I used to joke that uh, I had everything in perfect balance. I worked too hard, and I ran too fast, and I drank too much. And it was all in perfect balance. <laughs> Little did I know that I was running straight into a wall. Uh, at any rate, um, I had to stop running because I, I jiggered my knees. And Jackie kindly bought me a rowing machine. <laughs> now, the problem with a rowing machine, I should say, I, many of you may use them, is that they're specifically designed so that you can't strain or pull a ligament or a muscle, which means that if you're an overachieving man, you carry on until something worse happens. So I had been working very, very hard. I was tired in those days, not now. In those days, I cooked the family meal. I got the family meal bubbling. I nipped out um, to the shed where we had the rain machine to try to hit... Uh, I think the target was uh, five miles in 20 minutes at the full gearing of nine, which is pretty tough. And I've been trying for a long time. I hadn't managed it. And that evening, I managed it. And I thought, yes! And at the same time as I thought, yes, I thought, something's wrong. I don't really feel very well. I felt queasy and just odd. And I totted up, and I walked back into the, the kitchen, and I carried on with the meal. And then I got this blinding headache and a queasiness and a kind of cascade of multicolored lights. And I thought, because I was ignorant, I'd actually had two TIAs before, and I didn't know what was going on. So much of the theme of this part of the talk is just the importance of knowledge and the danger of ignorance. I had no idea what was happening to my body. And I thought then that it was a migraine, because it felt a bit like a migraine, or what I thought a migraine would be like. So I said to Jackie and the children, you carry on, you eat the meal. I just don't feel very hungry. And we all sat down and we watched a very, very bad film with George Clooney in it. <laughs> now, for snoring reasons, I was sleeping by myself at the back of the house. So rude. <laughs> I didn't say it was you. <laughs> <laughs> she's, out, she's out it herself. She's out it herself. <laughs> because Jackie was snoring, I was sleeping. <laughs> I was sleeping at the back of the house, um, and I, the next thing is so I went to bed, not feeling great, but feeling okay, and I woke up the next morning on the floor, having fallen out of the bed, um, unable to get up, and all I can remember at the time was an intense feeling of extreme irritation, because um, I thought, what a terrible, terrible start to the day. I'm lying on the floor, and weirdly, I can't get back up again, and eventually, after about 40 minutes, I managed to f uh, fight my way to my, my feet, and I hobbled to the shower for a shower. And then I couldn't get, couldn't lift my left leg into the shower. I thought, this is very weird. And what's going on? And I looked at myself in the mirror, and I had that classic stroke, downward slope of the mouth, and the, the, my face was kind of frozen on the, on the left side. And I can remember thinking, oh, I see, I've had a stroke. Because my grandmother had had a stroke. And so I knew a little bit about it. I thought it was a very old person's thing. And feeling almost proud of myself, it was a very weird thing, but when I was at school, I spent a lot of time skiving off rugby and cricket and sports, and sneaking off, pretending that I was ill when I wasn't. So when I was really ill, I felt oddly and weirdly proud. And so I knocked on the door where Jackie was sleeping, and I opened the door and I said, I think I've had a stroke. And Jackie screamed. <laughs> yeah, well, I actually knew there was something seriously wrong with Andrew the night before because he has never, ever, to my certain knowledge, not wanted to eat his dinner, especially when he's cooked it, which he had done, and he ate no dinner that night. 
Um, I'm a great sort of Googler, so when he said he was having flashing lights, I Googled away and I thought, I know what you've got, you've got a detached retina. <laughs> Quite definitely detached retina, I said, I've checked it all up on Google, we'll go into the hospital tonight. No, no, he said, they will make me wait for about four or five hours, I, I'll go tomorrow, I'm sure it'll be fine. So that was the first mistake, he's not insisting. I did try to insist, but um, he's always very stubborn about going to hospital. Fast. That was the first mistake, not to go into hospital and not to have recognised it because we might have been in a different place had we gone in that night before. Mm -hmm. uh, so when he came in saying he'd had the stroke, it was funny, I instantly knew as well because the, the face was, as, as you see the face in those, um, in those wonderful promotional videos. So we phoned an ambulance and this is the second little lesson. The ambulance didn't come for an hour. Uh, I was later told, because I did go into this, because I said he's having a stroke, please come immediately. Uh, we were later, we'd hit a shift change. So my advice to you is do not have a stroke at six in the morning, because that's when the shift change happens with the ambulance. Um, but once they did come, they were absolutely fantastic. Whisked him along, the blue light going, and he was so proud of the blue light, weren't he? He said, I've got I a can, bluey, I a can bluey. <laughs> Shall we blue him? Oh yes, I think we better blue him. And I said, yes. <laughs> so I, in a way, I, I had no idea what was going on. I wasn't taking it seriously at that point. I mean, I was frightened. I knew something weird had happened. And I had, I had lost a lot of the use of my left arm and leg. But yeah. I wasn't really scared at that point. Yeah. Well, uh, the next point I want to make is that Charing Cross, to where he was taken, is one of the um, six major stroke hospitals now in London. And the fact of that reorganisation, which I know was fought quite fiercely at the time, because some other hospitals, such as Kingston, our local hospital, uh, lost a lot of its stroke um, uh, focus. And they are now focused on certain six hospitals throughout London. But thank goodness, because we had teams of expert doctors there who saw Andrew on his first day. He was whisked straight into a scan and they confirmed it was a stroke. Um, he was then <coughs> taken to the operating theatre because the idea was to remove the clot which had formed. Um, I and say I torn my carotid, torn carotid artery, artery. Uh, and so they were going to operate. Um, they followed a very scary couple of hours for me and my three children who had come with us to hospital when they said, well, we're going to operate, we may be able to save him and we may not. And we sort of said, oh, well, can we, can we at least come and say a possible goodbye? No, they said it's too late, he's in the theatre. So I remember we just sat on the floor of a disused ward, I don't quite know how we found ourselves there. Uh, sat on the floor crying for a couple of hours um, and then the doctor came back and said they hadn't operated after all, it had been too dangerous. Um, so he, I didn't quite know what was happening then. Well, shall, I, shall I interject yeah. for what was happening? So a uh, dissection of the artery means they have to clear the blockage and the, the preferred way of doing it is to put a, like a tiny mini submarine up through the arterial system, goes in through the groin, then all the way up the arterial system through the brain and into the neck. To, to clear the blockage. It's like, a, as I said, a mini submarine. And they said to me beforehand, um, we, have, we have various choices. We could give you drugs radically to, to thin the blood, but they have catastrophic, or could have catastrophic side effects. But don't worry, we're going to do it this way. And so I sat there for hours and hours and hours, and they were driving this thing up my arterial system. And then they said, it's not working. Don't, but don't worry, we can give you some drugs instead. And I can remember saying, are those the same drugs that have catastrophic? And there's a long pause. And indeed, they did have, as it were, because at that point, the stroke wasn't too bad, but I had a secondary bleed on the brain as a result, which produced a much, much worse stroke, which I think was the second time they came in to say we'd lost him. Yeah, this was about two, two or three days later, actually. I don't think you were very much aware of those two or three days, Andrew. No. But two or three days, you were virtually sort of um, unconscious or asleep, and then we had this secondary bleed. And that was the point at which they gave these um, potentially catastrophic drugs and again told us that he might not survive. So... It was a very scary time, and although the first thing I want to say is that the doctors were just beyond amazing, and I can't thank those doctors and those nurses enough for what they did, um, but I've always had a bit of a bugbear about communication from doctors, and uh, I have to say, the way they told us these very stark <coughs> facts left a little bit to be desired. Um, I think if you're a doctor or a surgeon, you're working every day, you're coming across death and disaster every day, and it's part of, part of daily life for you. When it's happening to you and your family and it's something that hits you like a thunderbolt from the blue, you somehow don't really want to be told in quite such stark terms that uh, your loved one is just about to die, sort of get over it. Um, so I do think doctor's communication is a subject that um, there's more to be said about in due course. Um, anyway, there followed a fairly dismal two months in Charing Cross where Andrew <coughs> had um, 
uh, physio and rehabilitation, and then at the end of two months, it was time to be discharged. I'll come to that in just a second. Just, just on those two months, and on that uh, argument about the drugs and so on, I should say, I don't think the doctors had any choice at all. They did everything they possibly could, and the fact that the drugs had the secondary bleed effect, there was nothing they could have done about that. They'd have left it die or given me the drugs, so I'm not in any way criticising the staff. The doctors and the nurses were amazing. Um, but as a result of that, when I woke up, I couldn't get out of bed, I couldn't walk unaided to the loo, I would fall over straight away, and there was an awful lot that I couldn't do, and I got very, very intensive physiotherapy from a wonderful bunch of physiotherapists in Charing Cross, and they got me back on my feet again, they got me walking again, I was in a wheelchair a lot of the time, but I was beginning to walk again, and they even, because they knew I wanted to go back to work eventually, even rigged up um, a kind of TV system so I could, I could read an auto-cue and learn to read again. They were absolutely fantastic. But by the time I came out of hospital, I was, I mean, I could walk, but I was in a dangerous condition going up and down stairs. And I can remember you used to donut me, you used to come around me and help me get into the car. So I arrived home alive, recovering, <coughs> by no means anywhere near being able to go back to work. Mm. Um, one of the funny things that happened is he was on warfarin while he'd been in hospital for the two months, which um, keeps the blood flowing. Thin. Thin, thank you. Rat poison. Um, uh, and, and this has to be monitored with a blood test every day. So when we got home, um, the doctors had said to me, now, you, you need to get his blood done every day, so just take him to your local doctor's surgery. And so I thought, yes, I said, okay, that's fine. And then I realised that it took three people to get him to the car, um, <coughs> because we had to sort of literally sort of almost carry him to the car. The doctor's surgery was um, in the middle of, a, of Ishin, where we were then living, um, at least a five-minute walk from the car park. And I just thought, well, how am I going to do that? Um, and just the little things like that you didn't really think about at the time. And I hadn't thought to say to them in the hospital, well, how on earth will I get him to the doctor's surgery? I can't do that. Um, and it went from there, like, how can we get him into the shower? Because the shower had a step, and he couldn't climb up a step, and we hadn't thought of that. So we were suddenly hit with this whole raft of problems that we hadn't really anticipated coming from the very safe and supportive atmosphere of the hospital ward, where there were nurses galore, physios galore, to help do everything. And suddenly there was just me and Andrew, and we were really very stuck. Those first, those first weeks were very, were very, very, tough, very difficult. They? And I, I can remember hating the moment when I had to get out of bed in the morning because of what was going to follow, and being very scared about going up and down stairs. We put in extra banisters, we put in grab rails. rails in the shower, we put in all sorts of things, bit by bit by bit. But this business of independent living, there are so many very, very basic things that make the difference between being able to cope and not being able to cope. And that was the period when we discovered all of that. And I, then I should just say at that point, I think part because Andrew was in the media and high profile, we had all sorts of people phoning us up, being in touch from literally all over the world. And through them, we got to hear about a lot of things that we might not otherwise have known about. That's absolutely we? So true. the information about these things is essential. Andrew, for a while, had something called a FES, which is a something electrical stimulation thing. Um, which functional make, electric functional electric, yes, yeah. which helped with his walking. Um, but then that kept breaking down, and we had a few disasters with that. And then he went to a much simpler thing, which was just a leg brace um, to stop foot drop. But right. again, these things we found out about partly by people being in touch, didn't we, that yes. we wouldn't necessarily know about. Yes. I should say there's, there's two kinds of FES. There's the one that you do to try to regrow bits of your brain to try and send the messages. But I had something also, mm. a walk aid, which didn't break down. It was very, very good. I, I, I used for a while, very important in walking. But the real important point of this part of the story, I think, is money. Because I was still, the BBC kept me on, they didn't fire me, they kept me on, they hoped I'd come back, and therefore I was quite well paid. The Daily Mail would say far too well paid. <laughs> but that meant that I could buy in physiotherapy, and I think this is the single biggest message I want to say today. The hospital was great, physiotherapy in the hospital was great, most people are released back to their spouses or their homes or wherever they come from without nearly enough physiotherapy. The, the I think, rather self-justifying thing used to be that if you didn't get the recovery within three months, you wasn't going to come. It's complete balls, if you forget my expression. Um, you recover all the time, but you recover only by doing really hard, repetitive, not quite daily, but several times a weekly physiotherapy. The vast majority of people cannot afford the fees for neurophysiotherapists, which is why one of the 
uh, charities that I spend time raising money for and I'm very committed to. It's called the Arnie Action on Rehabilitation for Neurological Injury, which trains trainers to go around, around the country and help people learn to lift weights, learn to get up from the floor, and do all the basic things uh, at a fraction of the cost of a neurophysiotherapist. And I think one of the biggest policy issues is how we manage to help as a society people who have had strokes, tens of thousands of them, could be back at work, you know, uh, having a productive life, earning money, paying taxes, doing all the things the government want them to do, if they had a bit more physiotherapy for a bit longer. It's a massive issue for us, and I am not naive, and I'm not going to make any political points tonight, but I don't think there's any chance of this or any future government uh, ponying up the amount of money that's needed to pay for neurophysiotherapy for the people who need it. And therefore, I think it's an absolutely crucial thing for what we might call the third sector or charity. I have been, I've been unlucky in having a stroke. I've been incredibly lucky in my neurophysios and in being able to pay for them and carry on. It's been more than three years and I do neurophysiotherapy and strength training every single week. Several times a week. Four to five hours a week. Four to five hours a week. And have had for three years. And, and that I am has just made making progress. And I am yeah. just making progress, but hardly any. We, we should mention your physio's um, special special technique involving a kettlebell. Isn't okay, it? so this is, a, this is a really, really unfair, unfair story. And I'm not going to mention my wonderful North London neurophysiotherapist, Joe Tucky, by name. Who was brilliant. Who was brilliant. Who was wonderful. But anyway. One of the things I have to do is to try to strengthen the shoulder. I use a kettlebell, and I put it up like this. And she handed me the kettlebell one day, and I reached for it and dropped it straight onto my toe. Uh, and I broke the toe, and the, big, the, the nail of the big toe lifted off, and ghastly. Luckily, luckily, I had given Jeremy Hunt a very hard time on the programme a few days before, so I was more or less carried into the operating theatre on the shoulders of the junior doctors. <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, the weird thing was, I don't know if anyone can see this, but see that this figure here can now move. No, that's a really important movement because it means I can, in theory, grasp something and let it go. And for three years, that finger wasn't moving. With the pain and the adrenaline surge of dropping a kettlebell on my toe, I've got a fantastic <laughs> forward movement. So all physiotherapists watching, if you give up on your, pa on your patient, if you're really worried about them, forgive my language, just drop something fucking heavy on their face. <laughs> <laughs> or possibly hit them across the back of the head with a large object. Just waiting to see what the next kettlebell will do. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> um, yeah, so physio. I, well, Andrew, Andrew says that you know that the government won't pony up, and of course they won't. But I do think there is a, a cost-benefit analysis to be done on how much actually would be saved, how much the economy would save by investing in physiotherapy. Um, because if you think of the, the cost of someone that can't get back to work, someone who's therefore you know living on benefits, quite often the carer will have to be um, not working either. And I'm sure if someone would really do these economic sums. It could be proven that actually investing properly in rehabilitation and physio is a very worthwhile investment. Um, it's a case I've tried endlessly to put to ministers and they go yes, yes, yes and nothing happens about it. So I will continue to try to do so. Um, I was going to say a little bit at this stage about carers. Um, not too much about carers, um, but a little bit because I took, um, I took the best part of a year of work um, to be Andrew's carer at the time. Because at first it was, it was hospital and then he was really quite dependent on me for the first couple of months. Um, and then I wrote a piece for The Guardian about being a carer and had a most amazing response. Um, and one of the things people said was, the trouble if you're a carer is that the person you're looking after is obviously in such a worse state than you that you don't ever want to complain about it. But I had some very, very sad stories about people who'd given up work to look after a loved one, maybe an elderly relative or a husband or a wife, and then couldn't get back into work. Um, and so that started another little campaign to try to get carers leave so that people can take time off to care, but then they don't automatically lose all their rights um, to go back to work. So that's another little side issue which has come up uh, as a result of what we've been going through. But it's a huge side issue, isn't it? Because you can't, on the one hand, say to people, we as the state are not going to give you the support that would, that would allow you to be semi-independent. Mm -hmm. We insist that your family, your loved, your loved ones, do it for you, but we will not help them either. Mm. You know, they can't in every way. Mm. Mm. They try to. 
Um, <laughs> now, we've got about another five or ten minutes before we're going to take some questions. So, I'm just thinking... Shall I come on to sort of life yes. more recently? Yeah. Because the truth of the matter is I have recovered well enough to do my job more or less as I wanted to do it. I, um, if I'm put on this earth for anything, it's to be impertinent to Boris Johnson on a weekly basis. <laughs> I'm now luckily able to do that. Um, I, I've been filming, I'm making some films about popular novels, which means getting myself around, getting myself onto a plane to Berlin, getting around Berlin, being able to walk up and down, um, and walk and talk and do the filming. And I can do all of those things, I'm lucky. I've got the mental capacity to be able to write books and write scripts. And I can do all the things that I, I really want to do. And I've had a wonderful uh, efflorescence of my hobby as a painter as well. But I am still pretty wobbly. I walk like a drunken sailor. I get intensely frustrated by the fact that I cannot walk as fast as most people. Um, my left arm is still, most of the time, pretty useless. And I've got long, I'm still making progress. But after three years, I had a huge amount of hard work I am personally quite frustrated by the lack of progress. Jackie does not need to be my carer for most things. The few little jobs like top buttons and so forth that still need to be done. By and large, most of the time, um, I can look after myself. I have a very simple foot, foot splint which allows me to walk. But I, I really want to go much further, which means that I'm still spending a lot of money on, on neurophysiotherapy and spending a lot of time on it. I think that the recovery from the stroke, every stroke is different, we all know that. Some people never recover, of course they die. Some people stay in a wheelchair for the rest of their lives. However much physiotherapy they're given, that's it. They're not going to get beyond that. Some people make a complete recovery, so you can't tell if you've ever had a stroke. And some people, like me, are somewhere in the middle. So everyone's different. Nonetheless, I think it's incredibly important to say that stroke recovery goes on for years and years and years. And after the first shock and, and symptom and all the rest of it, you're still, left, still left with this condition. I don't think there has been a day in which every hour I have not been aware of having a stroke since that, and probably every minute of every hour. Everything I do, whether it's try to make toast, tie a tie, put some shoes on, brush my teeth, is affected by the fact that I've had a stroke. I am, as I say, incredibly lucky. I have a wonderful job. I have a wonderful life. I have a wonderful family looking after me. But it is extraordinarily tough. And so when you're talking to people who've had strokes, remember that the consequences go on for a very long time. Mm. Although I think what we mustn't overlook is how far you have come in three years. As I say, when Andrew came out of hospital, he literally couldn't walk without three of us sort of trying to support him. And now, as you say, you've recently been filming in Paris and Berlin completely threw, by yourself. Threw away the stick. Threw away the stick, but far too early on, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, but now, really are very independent. He used to ask me to tie his tie every day, which used to drive me mad because I've never been able to tie a tie even though I wore one as a school child many years ago. And after about, what, a year of me tying your ties, and I'd never get the length right, he decided he'd be glad to do his own tie. So you now do your own tie perfectly well, don't you? Um, and all these little things gradually have improved a lot. Partly because we've had sort of help with things, a lot of aids out there which have helped, haven't there? Yeah, a lot um, of aids, yeah. I'm still waiting for the, the cooking aids because I keep being told yeah. that there's all sorts of things that can get Andrew cooking again because he really was a very good cook indeed and I'm an actually rubbish cook, but uh, we're still waiting for the cooking to return. But apart from that and shoelaces, uh, you still can't tie shoelaces. I can't tie shoelaces. Um, I've forgotten how to tie shoelaces, mm. although I can now use my left hand just about enough to do it in theory. I have completely forgotten how to tie a shoelace. Mm. But there are special laces you can get anyway now, which, which helps. Sure, so. yeah. But apart from that, it, it really is amazing how much independence people can get back having had such a, a serious stroke. Um, and if, if I could just make the political point that you can't make, uh, I do think when the government um, starts making cuts to the, um, the PIP, it really is not going to help. It's going to make more people more dependent, and I can't see the logic of it. Thank you. Andrew, of course, can't say whether he agrees with that or not. <laughs> I can ask this. I'm allowed to ask questions. I can ask the question what does the phrase on the way to work actually mean? <laughs> Well, I don't know the answer. <laughs> no, no. no, but you know, you lose the money if you are on the way to work. Yeah. Um, does that mean that you can walk along to a, to a, a job office that's the hour of the I don't know, I don't know what it means. Yeah. It's 
Not a good time, but anyway, that, that fight continues. <coughs> I think that's probably all we have to say for now. Uh -huh. take questions. I know that quite a lot of questions have come in already. Well, there are two um, questions And I know some here. other people wanted to ask them as well. So, yeah. Tonight, there are two questions here. I know that Nicola Lowe, who's an occupational therapist working in social care, has a question. And she's in the audience. So um, I don't know if she wants to raise the question here Hello. or she would like me to read it out. I can't. Um, I will read it out. So your question was, as an OT within a team of community therapists, how can we improve the offer to people so that there is the possibility of ongoing rehabilitation post-discharge? Current provision is skewed towards the acute hospital care, the integrated health, stroke, social care pathways, falling short after six weeks funded intermediate care in most parts of the country. It's a very, very good question. And it's a postcode lottery, frankly. There are parts of the UK, parts of London, where the local authority helped provide care for a lot longer than six weeks. There are other parts of the country where six weeks you'd be very, very lucky. And the quality of care differs. So yes, what the OTs do early on, teaching you the simple ways of getting independent, how to, how to chop up food, how to eat properly, how to get yourself dressed, how to get yourself showered. That was a big problem for me. And above all, this is one that I, got, I learned from the army people, what to do when you fall over. A lot of people with stroke are terrified of falling. I, if, if I fell down here, I could get myself to my feet straight away, thanks to army. So there are lots of really important practical things, but by far the most important thing to remember is it can't be done for most people in six weeks. It takes a lot, lot longer, so it's funding. And I, I think the real question is how do we create networks to support funding to get more OT and more physiotherapy for people for months and months and sometimes for years. We've always said that this country is absolutely brilliant at keeping people alive, saving people from the stroke and those first few weeks in hospital I think we're probably second to none. Um, the teams that work in these hospitals now are fantastic. Um, the scanning, the care, beyond belief. But then there's this sort of thing, well we've kept you alive, we've, we've stopped you dying from a stroke and now off you go. And so you keep people alive, but then you don't think about the quality of life they're going to have for the next however many years. And I think it really does need a slight switch of emphasis to be thinking about what you do to support people when they come out of hospital following a stroke. And I, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And um, it comes down to very, very basic things. I mean, simple, it's simple, simple fixes. That you've done. Um, and I'm very, very struck by the fact that, I think the other thing we haven't mentioned is when I was in hospital, I was in various hospitals and clinics and so on, and gyms. I kept meeting people in their 20s and 30s who had strokes. We still have this mindset, I think, as a culture, that stroke is one of those things that happens to some people right at the end of the life for which they then die. So it's not really an ongoing issue. The number of people, I, I met a young woman who'd had a stroke while giving birth, she was in her 20s. I met lots of young blokes who'd had strokes. And talking to stroke doctors, they talk about things we never think of, like when you go to have your hair done if you're a woman, you need your head back in that basin, a very big stroke risk, the basin on the, on the back of the neck. Um, people who've had strokes from... Um, Turning might, around in the car, and the might, cars yeah. look behind you to see if a car's coming. Apparently that's a, that can cause a stroke. Right? There are lots of things... All sorts happen. of people that we just couldn't quite believe they'd have a stroke from doing something so simple. And so when people say that, you know, the OT, the, the physiotherapy, isn't so important, <coughs> people think that, they're often thinking of very, very old people who are on their way out anyway. What they have to think about is a young, vigorous 20-year-old or a 30-year-old who's had a sudden stroke and could give another 40 or 50 years of productive life to their loved ones, their families, their employers and society, if they get the right help. That was question one. <laughs> and the second question is from Paula Piazka. I'm sorry, Paula. Yola. He's never been any good with Yola Piazkowska. Yeah, Jackson. Me. That's you. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, I write a blog which is Build Mama House and it's about finding really nice design ways of, uh, oh, hello. Um, it, it's, it's about building a home for yourself where it's accessible. If you have reduced mobility, actually have a really nice looking home. So my question to you is, how has this impacted on your home and the long term impact on your home as well? Well, we can talk about his kettlebells because his kettlebells are all over one of our rooms. <laughs> um, we also have a, I mean, we have a home room given over to Andrew's gym, don't we, at home? 
Uh, we had a leg press and um, 49,000 kettlebells and uh, a bike. Actually, the bike doesn't work as well as we thought it would, a stationary bike. Um, I have tried almost everything, I should say. Yeah. A leg press to get strength back in the leg is a very important thing. Um, we moved back to North London where we, we yeah. first met as a result of um, even, even we can't afford a big house in North London, so it's a little narrow house with vast numbers of stairs, which is very stupid, but at least keeps me fit. I don't think it does. Um, I, at one point, I'm, one of the things I really, I, I miss, above all, I would say four things. I miss being able to run, I miss being able to swim, because I can't swim, I miss being able to cycle, and I miss being able to ski. And I hope one day that I'll get them back, it's a long way off, uh, with cycling. I invested in a tricycle because my problem I go I get on a bicycle and my left leg would just skitter straight off the, the pedal. Or if it didn't, I would lose my balance and fall straight over. And I fell over a lot and gave up the bicycle, so I bought a tricycle. The trouble with tricycles is you can't really cycle them uphill. And also, of course, self-evidently they're wider, and in busy London roads cars clip you. Or if you try to stop them over any kind of indentation in the road like a storm drain you simply fall straight over. And if you've tied yourself to the pedals, as I had, then you can't get up again. And a couple of times I've been found at the side of Regent Park, lying prone on a tricycle, and the kind policeman have lifted me back up and pushed me off again. And it hasn't been the most dignified or successful way of taking exercise again. So I think one of the big issues is what kind of exercise you can take after stroke. I haven't been cracked, cracked that one. The house has got extra banisters, it's got grab rails, it's got things to hold on to in the shower, I no longer take baths very often. I've always believed that a bath is something for once a year. Um, <laughs> but it's not, it's, it's not even that anymore. Um, and the thing, by the way, if you're wondering when, how often to wash your socks, I was taught this at an early age, what you do is you take them off and you throw them at the wall, and if they fall down again, they don't wash them. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like with the cooking, Andrew thinks he's straight me as he can't so use the washing machine as well. But, <laughs> um, but apart from that, in answer to the question about the home, we, we haven't done much else, really. Um, at first, we had a real problem with stairs, but then we found with, a, with an extra banister, that was okay, wasn't it? You don't find stairs a problem now. Um, we did actually move house, though, because um, of public transport. Where we used to live was quite a long way out of central London. And certainly in the first year following Andrew Stroke, he couldn't use public transport. He couldn't walk to the bus stop and then get on the bus and then go to the tube and so on. Um, and so to get into work, we used to take taxis. Um, and given this was about, what, 15, 18 miles out of um, central London, we were paying a fortune in taxis and it just also, became unsupportable. Also, so. try getting in and out of a London taxi if one of your legs doesn't work yeah, at all. I eventually worked out a technique for it, but it's difficult. So we thought we'd, we'd move in, we downsized. We're the only people I think who downsized and spent more money, but we downsized to a place um, which is just north of the BBC. And Andrew can, in fact, now even walk to the BBC through Regent's Park. So, yeah. I mean, partly it wasn't so much the house itself we had to adapt, but we had to adapt where we lived. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. Um, and you have to adapt then how you, how you, know, how you live your life. Um, and I used to do lots of running, and lots of uh, uh, physical exercise. And so you'd have to find things that, that, that plug those gaps for you. You'd have to find the pub, which is about, was about to 10 yards <laughs> down the road. <laughs> 10 yards down the road, it's a very, very nice pub. When, when it's sunny, I can sit outside the pub with my old mate and, and drink a pint of beer. Hi there. Hi, thanks. It's been a really interesting talk. Um, like the first lady, I'm also an occupational therapist, and I work for the Lambeth Community Stroke Team. And we provide um, rehab for people in the community who've had a stroke for 12 weeks after they've had their stroke and they go home. I just wanted to know if you were offered any therapy from the NHS once you left hospital. And you've spoken a lot about physiotherapy. I was just wondering if you'd ever thought about having occupational therapy at home afterwards or privately for it to help you return to independence. You were talking about how it was very difficult with washing and dressing and returning to work, and that's the role of our job. So I just wondered if you'd thought about that. We missed out the, we missed out the well, um, Roehampton bit. Yes, so what happened to me afterwards was I talked my way into uh, Roehampton um, Centre, the Douglas Barger Centre, which was very close to us, where I got physio and occupational therapy for, I think, a six month. weeks, a Always. month. A month. Um, but after that, it stopped completely, and I had to pay for it. Um, I, 
I know there is tension between OT and physio. I understand <laughs> it. And I, and I know that I'm treading on, on delicate issues here. Um, for myself, I found that OT was really important in the early stages, and I learned to do a series of particular specific things. How to do buttons one-handed, how to shower one-handed, all that kind of thing from, from the occupational therapists. But after that, my main uh, idea was to get my leg and my arm moving better, and that does seem to require repeated and quite tough physiotherapy. So I've gone more towards the physio side. Um, and as I say, I have been in a position where I've been able, luckily, to pay for it myself. But no, I wasn't offered much of that, apart from the Roehampton money. I think it is a bit of a postcode lottery, like you mentioned. It is, yes. And also, just so you know, there is actually an amazing charity called Wheels for Wellbeing in Hearn Hill that helps people who've had a stroke or a neuro condition to return to cycling. Oh, so if you ever want to check it out. I, oh, I live in the wrong part lot. of London. <laughs> 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 Bad enough having gone through a near-death experience. <laughs> um, no, no, I, I, I really want to get back to cycling, so that's really, that's really good to hear. Um, I should also say there was a period where I went to the National Neurological Hospital as well for they, they offer very intensive upper limb work. And they were, again, lovely and wonderful. And they, I, I from a lot of people who have stroke that I had was um, so-called frozen shoulder. So I had a very, very painful shoulder. And that was sorted out for me there. But I, it was too early in my recovery. And I did lots and lots of physiotherapy and lots of OT and couldn't really get any better. And I was very frustrated, um, despite all their good work. So I've had lots of different interventions and I carry on open-mindedly looking for more. Well, uh, the, the other suggestion I would have for, for the cycling, speaking as a, as a neurophysio, so <laughs> <don't know> <laughs> is, is tandems. Uh, I took one of my... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I took one of my, as a neurophysio, I took one of my stroke patients from London to Paris on the back of a tandem. Do you know so. how heavy he is? <laughs> yeah, he's going to be a big lad on the front. <laughs> but the, it's not a bad idea, actually. Yeah, I, I think Andrew did highlight that the, one of the key problems is this, is this split, in health, the split in care between when the health and social care separated. Yeah. Yeah. Because health and care, once they're out of hospital, and it's that joined up thinking of, of, of putting those two people back together again, that that's going to get you back to work and keep you out of hospital. I think mean, there were some parts in the UK where they're starting to realise we've got to put those back together again. Mm. Uh, so my question is, uh, how do we think we can persuade this government to see that, that we need some joined up thinking? We can't help the health guys saying, well, let's get them out and make it social services care, and the social <laughs> services care guys saying, well, hang on a minute, without, without health, we can't get these people back to work. Well, I think it's a real shame in that Norman Lamb, um, who was the care minister in the last in the coalition government, is, is a Lib Dem chap, sadly now departed. He really was on the right track on this, and he was trying really hard. I had quite a lot of conversations with him just before the last election about you know what he was trying to do, where it was going. Uh, but I think this government is just not really there at all with it, are they? I think they mean well sometimes. Sometimes. What, what, I, what I would say to you, what I would say to you, okay, what, you, what you say is you want a society where people work hard, play by the rules, do the right thing, and then they can pay taxes and help sustain the rest of society. So, given that there's tens of thousands of people who've had strokes who would like to be able to do that, but you haven't given them the help that would get them there, how do you work out the economics of letting all those people rot, as it were? And they could be out there, they could be, they could be contributing. That's what I would say. This is a hard-nosed kind of conservative policy. Give people the skills and the, the abilities to let them get back to work and contribute. That's all they're asking for. Mm -hmm. Lady Dan, I have a question. So, sorry, I'm just, I didn't mean to oh, sorry, crash yeah. that, Jackie, forgive me. Um, my name is Tom Jameson. I'm the editor of uh, a disability magazine called ABLE. And um, one of the things that's been puzzling me for years, I, I suppose, is, um, and I wonder if you have any purely neutral, of course, views on why, furthermore, to the last question, um, none of the political parties seem to be capable of seeing that there are 18 million disabled votes on the table to be picked up. Why do people not make policy, do you think, toward disabled people as a community, do you think? That's a very interesting question. Um, you're right, they don't think about the votes of disabled people uh, one little bit, and it's surprising really that they don't, but I think maybe they don't see 
disabled people as a separate lobby, and quite often the elderly are disabled, and I think politicians have always gone more for what they call the grey vote rather than specifically disabled people. Um, I guess it's just it's just years of discrimination, isn't it, which is uh, it's still there. It's very worrying. And I, I have a, a slightly more this controversial take on it too, is I don't think the disabled are a community. I think there's lots and lots of people with different kinds of disabilities who don't naturally look at each other and say, I'm like you or I'm like you. It's taken me quite a long time to regard myself as a disabled person. For a long time I just said, I know I'm probably had a stroke and I'm recovering from it. I now regard myself as a disabled person. All this is a political statement, mm. but I think disabled people have to be a little bit more open to each other sometimes. And the, the endless disability charities, they very rarely come together work together and speak together. And I think we need a bit more, a bit more political organisation at that level as well. Mm. I'm going to ask this lady here in the second row. Hello, my name is uh, Tess Lancashire. Um, I'm a stroke survivor. Um, I had a stroke actually in 1989, which seems like an awful long time ago. Um, I think for a long time I've just been kind of been observing everything, what's happening and what is available for people that have had strokes. I didn't have any um, video, I've, um, re sorry, I have aphasia as well. Um, I didn't have a, um, rehab or anything like that for other reasons. So I ended up doing my own kind of work as well, my own video and rehab. Uh, which is really quite important. But, but one thing that I noticed that nothing really was there for anyone was more like psychological stuff because it does hit you um, when one minute you're 24, getting on, getting on to that stage, which is what I was hoping to do, rushing really hard, trying to get my equity card, and then one minute you're out. And there is still not enough, I don't think, sort of psychological help for people because as you say, Andrew, it is something that goes on and on and on, and you have to get there. You want to recover. It's nothing that you need to get there. It's, it's nothing that you want to happen. You know, I mean, either further away, a different strategy, and another way of thinking as well. So, um, You know Tom Belcher, do you? Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So I'm going to just say something about somebody who's been through a stroke, um, because it's a very important thing. I uh, work with a guy called Tom Belcher, who um, is a very, very tough-looking young guy. He had a massive, massive, massive near-fatal stroke at the age of 22, and he had been um, quite interested in martial arts, and he was a bit of a gym bunny before the stroke. So again, in the age when there was even less physiotherapy and help than there is now, he went off into a basement with his weights and he forced himself to recover by, by lifting weights and doing really, really tough physical exercises. And he then produced a book, a sort of handbook on how he'd done it. And that's the basis of Arnie that I was mentioning before and all around the country. So one of my major messages is if you've had a stroke or you know someone who's had a stroke, particularly if they're relatively young and they're not getting the kind of help that they need, and you can't afford a neurophysio three times a week, Google or look up Arnie and, and read about Tom Belcher because that is an extraordinary personal story, which is, I think he has helped more individual people than almost anybody else has ever come across in this country. So there are people who've had strokes who've turned it into a weapon to change society, and he's one of them. In terms of the depression, you're absolutely right. I am lucky because I'm Scottish, so I don't have emotions. And if I did, <laughs> they'd be pretty bleak ones. So there is never a morning that you wake up and it turns out that you haven't had a stroke after all. I think, I think that's really important. I think certainly at the time a stroke happens, you need lots and lots of psychological, emotional support. But also I would say as time progresses, I think, I'll be honest, I think after two years you suddenly got very down because you realised that you weren't getting better as fast as you thought you were going to. In fact, it was very sweet. When Andrew was in hospital at first, he announced he was off to St. Petersburg at Easter. This was in January, when he was fully recovered. 
Now, I knew that he wasn't going anywhere near St. Petersburg at Easter. He'd probably still be in the hospital at Easter. Um, but you were very optimistic at first, weren't you? And I think gradually, as it sinks in, what a horrendously slow, long, hard path it is to recovery. I think depression can sort of pick you then as well. So I think it's not only just at the beginning. I think it's along the way that people could really do with a lot more support. But uh, it ain't there, and the funds aren't there. So. My you know, suggestion is a question. Right, I've got Thank you. Uh, Tony Heaton from Shake. Andrew, I wanted to ask you, I get patronised every day as a disabled person, and I wondered if you turn that to your advantage with people like Boris Johnson, or whether in fact you did get patronised, and how you dealt with that. I wasn't patronised by Boris Johnson, but I think he had come on, we're, we're veering off the scope, but we'll do it briefly. He had come on, uh, I know I got a lot of criticism for that interview, because I interrupted him so much, and I think it, I regret the fact that was a difficult interview to watch because no one wants to watch two people interrupting each other and it was a bit scratchy and a hard watch. My problem was I think Boris came on with a series of things that he was going to say, come what may. He had, he had his view and I was determined to, to make him explain in detail how not being part of the single European market would affect our exports and imports. And when he wasn't, I, had, I felt I had a chance of either lying on the floor and letting Boris jump up and down on me or doing what I did and, and, and tackling him. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a good interview, and I wasn't terribly pleased with it, but I think more because of what he was doing than me. But I think the question is, sorry if I can answer the question, is do you feel patronised ever as a disabled person? My father certainly did, because he was deaf. Um, and he always used to say, people think, if you're deaf, you're daft. Daft, he said. Um, and I think he often did feel patronised. It used to make him very angry. I'm not sure that you do feel patronised. I haven't you? felt that. I mean, a lot mm. of people stop me in the street and say, "How are you? Are you still there?" And they're quite shocked by how badly I'm walking and so on. And if it happens two or three times in the morning, I can be quite down by lunchtime. Um, but no, most people are actually quite friendly and open, saying, "Well done, you know, keep going and so forth." I get much more sort of support and reassurance from people around me than I get anything else. I feel very lucky in that. Andrew, how did you find, uh, Ian James from the short time, how did you find the re-entry back into work again? Well, first thing to say, I was, I, I keep using this word lucky, but it's how, what I feel despite having had a stroke. The BBC was really good to me. Um, I was mainly concerned, because I do my interviews like now, sitting down, so I wasn't standing. Uh, most of the time. I was mainly concerned because I think what happened on the left hand side of the body, among the other things that didn't work properly, was my left lung. So I would be talking like this, I would suddenly run out of air, I couldn't speak anymore. And so I found, and also although I didn't have, I was able to speak, I had slight problems around my mouth, and so I was talking a little bit like this, and running over there, and so the first few months of the show were quite, not traumatic, but were quite difficult because I was spending much more time thinking about how I was articulating words than the words themselves, um, and the speed of speaking and so forth. So that was difficult. Um, the BBC gave me a couple of, exam couple of chances to do interviews before I was back full-time on the show. I interviewed um, David Miliband, I think, and David Cameron before the show was back full-time, so I got sort of to test out my skills, as it were, and my ability to concentrate over 30 minutes a couple of times before it was live all the time. Um, but then, tiny little things, um, on the programme now, the very first bit where I'm standing looking down the camera talking about the week, as it were, I now recorded that, because a few times I was doing it, for, uh, doing it live, and I could feel the air going out of my lungs, and I was panicking, because I'm not going to get to the end of the sentence. So there's the specific things, but by and large, I would say the BBC have been very, very good at helping me through the process, and most people, I fear, are not in that situation of their employers. Probably one more question, and then we're going to have to go. <coughs> yes, yeah. Oh, hi. Thank you for joining us. Andrew, um, very insightful. My name's Jake Campbell, and I'm a crossbench peer in the and Lords. And a very good friend of Jack's when he was alive. Um, my question to you is to both of you, really. Um, you say, Andrew, that disabled people should come together they get together to make their points of view. Well, actually, the disability movement has been going for 20 minutes, 20, 20 minutes, 20 years, um, and we have put up some very strong campaigns 
and the main one probably being the disability discrimination tax campaign that this year is its 20th anniversary. So, as a political movement, why do you think that we are one so unknown as a civil rights movement, like the movement of women and girls? And so, uh, how could we improve that? Because if you aren't aware of it, then we're in trouble. All right. Can I come in first and just say I mean, I think. I, I didn't like the fact that the, um, all the different uh, groups, the Disability Group, the Equal Opportunities Commission, the Race Relations, they all came together under the Equality Commission. I don't think that was good for anybody. I think um, I opposed it at the time and I oppose it still. And I think, I do think the disability lobby has lost out in that coming together. And that the whole grouping together now of everything under the heading Equality, I think has been very bad for disabled people. I think the other thing that I, I rail about constantly is uh, papers like the Daily Mail that are constantly running stories about you know, the guy on benefits who runs a marathon in his spare time, or the woman who's claiming benefits who's actually um, you know, running a brothel. Uh, there's been a concerted campaign over the last few years, I think, to, to make it out that disability is something to be ashamed of, that most of the disabled are scroungers anyway. And I think that has impacted on public perceptions. I think there's been a rise in disability hate crimes over the years. Um, and I, I think that's a very worrying thing and something that, that people need to, to come together to fight against. But I'll, I'll let you say why you think they work together. As I think people. it's a really difficult question, to which I don't have an easy answer, which is unlike me. Um, I think that, first of all, we have to accept that most of us are empathetic and want to help others most of the time, but we are all also, and the voters generally, are quite self-interested. And also there is a natural, I think, human <coughs> tendency to look away from what we find frightening or distasteful or worrying. And so I think people look away from disability because they're frightened of it. But I also think we don't get the message over strongly enough that disability is not something that happens to other people. It's going to happen to you, it's going to happen to your loved ones, it's going to happen to your parents, your children. It's all around you, and therefore, it is something that self-interest should dictate. For you. It's, not, it's not a question of charity or empathy or being nice to other people. It's a question of thinking about yourself and what is likely to happen to you in your lifetime, which is why I think stroke is so important, because it really does fall um, like, like the rain on the, the just and on the unjust <coughs> fella alike. Um, but the other part of the story, I think sometimes we haven't been um, good enough in. Is, 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 the, is the positive side, the optimistic side of the story, that so many people with disabilities are able to, you know, to improve their lives and with relatively small amounts of help to transform their lives. And I think the story has got to be one of self-interested transformation above all else. And perhaps as a lobby, we, I say we, haven't been able to get that over well enough. Yeah. But we resolve to be there in the future. Um, I think on that note, we are going to have to wind up now. So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, a little shameless plug, if I may, there is also a Jack Ashley Memorial Lecture, which is going to be on July the 5th this year, when Frank Gardner, the BBC correspondent who was shot and remains very badly injured, but uh, again, carries on in an amazing way um, and is really pretty independent despite his many disabilities, he will be giving that lecture in July. I'd just like to say again my huge warm thanks to the Morris family. Our two yeah, families yeah. have been yeah, great yeah. friends over the years and it's lovely to, to work together still and um, lovely to see Irene in the audience. Irene just found some wonderful photos of um, Jack and Alf together in China that she's just given me, which have been very nice and I'll share with my sisters. So thank you very much to uh, everyone who's helped organise this evening and um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank disability discrimination by carpet bombing the entire country with lectures. <laughs>
it's absolutely obvious that we are not joined up in a way that is getting the maximum effect for these issues that are, um, are, are before all of us. And I would just encourage you to, to um, uh, really stay involved with DLF, um, Disability Rights UK, other organisations. We'd be happy to link up. We think we have an unprecedented opportunity between now and October when the eyes of the world will be on the UK, on the Global Congress for Rehabilitation. And we would like to uh, truly, truly start a massive movement uh, on social media and others mm -hmm. to highlight on some of the issues that have been described tonight mm -hmm. and try and uh, galvanize around <coughs> one to three issues that we think would make a long-term impact on the UK in providing justice in some of these areas where, where it might be lacking at the moment. So um, all I want to do now is thank Andrew and Jackie, uh, Lady Morris and her daughter Jill, um, for, for participating and making this a reality um, so that others can, can benefit. And then I'd like to thank the DLF staff and the Short Trust teams that have made the event a success tonight. So thank you very much for coming.